Ah, yes. What's good, everybody? Welcome back to Veterans Minimum live in Sticky Paws Studios. My bro, fist me. Gentle, gentle. Yeah, dude. You, yeah, you're is... you're ill. Yeah, I'm down. I'm pretty down bad, bro. I got a little. Uh, I got a little staff. Has little... the gram seen this yet? Nah, I haven't posted it. Yeah, it's you... the first time. Yeah, staff infection. Yeah, I feel like I got stung by twenty bumblebees all in a two. So they took the measurements of uh, like the infected area to mm -hmm. so they could monitor and track, and it was uh, two by one point five. Okay. And I feel like in that little area, 20 bumblebees just stung me there. That's how my hand feels. Have you seen the video of the guy that actually like purposefully gets stung by a whole bunch of crazy insects? Definitely a white dude. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. I wonder if he gets like what you have every time. Like he, you have to take the, the measurements. So like you, uh, <laughs> you're definitely not, what do they call that, ambulance chasing? Or, uh, where you like post like, oh... I'm sick again, you know, yeah, 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 like those people. So like respect for you not doing that. Oh, but, thanks, um, man. But I think once you do heal, I think you should make a really big deal about it. Like start a GoFundMe, like the whole nine yards. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> one of my friends has COVID survivor in his uh, bio, <laughs> and he only has it because like how crazy it was in New York. And by the way, he never got COVID. I was like, yeah, bro, you know, he's like, yeah, but we, I survived it. I was like, <laughs> All right. Respect. If we, if that's Mad what we're doing, I, I fuck with it a little bit. I fuck with it a little bit. But uh, yeah, back. Um, I explained on the last episode with Josh why we didn't record last week, and um, you and I are kind of to blame for that, bro. Because we spent like thirty minutes on the eighteen game schedule, and I was gonna release that, and then NFL free agency was absolutely ridiculous. Oh, dude, yeah. So I felt like the timing of it was wrong, and that was the only episode that I had. So I just pieced it at the end of the Monday show. If you guys haven't checked that out, please go and check that out. Rate, review, subscribe, wherever you listen to your podcast. The whole nine, at Veterans Minimum, everywhere. And, yeah. By the way, you know what app I've been on a ton lately? Bumble? No. Uh I'm more of a hinge guy. I got class. Oh, I... But I wasn't I'm even. Sorry. Go, I wasn't even. I like the ladies there, to make the gotta, move first. You gotta, yeah. You know what? So that's a hell of a point. But LinkedIn, bro. You did go on a little bit of a rant, a LinkedIn rant. You, we've talked about it before. You do it because you're like, one day I will be in in Connecticut. You know, you'll be back on the East Coast working for ESPN. So you're like, that's where ESPN people live. LinkedIn is if you are. A content creator if you're honestly anybody mm -hmm. that's where you got to be posting it's organic it hasn't been tampered with with bots and ais and how are the like, ads are there they're like ad posts what do you mean like you know like on instagram i'll go four scrolls in and then i see a sponsored ad for a post no you don't really see that on there see that's where it's like really fucked up because like there might be yeah. you might you might see a promotional ad for Fox Sports and they're looking for XYZ position. Like gotcha. you'll see those pop up because obviously you put in what your field is and what your expertise is and what you do. Mm -hmm. So they'll recommend, hey, Fox Sports needs a video editor. You could click on that. Um on air talent for the MGM or whatever it might be. Right. And I've just been pushing a ton of people, man. Shout out to Austin in the back. I told him to start posting on Facebook. Yeah, his Facebook, I th I think, he's, might be his biggest following on Bizarre Junkies. Or he's one got of like a hundred thousand followers for sure. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Facebook was the one last year. I feel like LinkedIn. I feel like Gary V right now telling everyone. Let me just tell you, you got to get ahead. You're so fucking young right now. <laughs> you just got to get ahead of the game. You gotta get ahead of the curve right now. 900 posts a day. 900 if posts. If you're not thinking content strategy and having people follow you around with a camera, what are you doing? <laughs> I love I love Gary Vee's content, but I do I go in waves with him, bro. Cause it's like I can get an injection of him and it feels like I just ride this this entrepreneurial high. And then I'm just like, all right. Let me start implementing some of what this guy's talking about. Cause you could just sit there forever and just be like, yeah. I got time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I also do feel, uh, and we'll get into the show in a second. But I've been, I've been ranting about this lately too. How, whenever, when I got into the content space, 
And you'd be a great person to ask too, because we, we both kind of, and one of the reasons why we get along and why we built this relationship together is because you also do what I do too. Right? Like you're behind the camera, you're helping run a studio, you're producing other people's content, and I'm sure they come to you for advice as well once they see your resume. So yeah. my whole thing is when I look at creating content, I try to not chase a trend and not chase a fad that's like relevant right now. And yeah, you could get that quick explosion and burst where overnight you have 300,000 followers and you're able to monetize. Cool. But eventually there's a shelf life to that. Correct. Right? And the reason why I'm bringing this up is Gary Vee's an exception because, you know, he tells you his story of the wine stuff when he was like 19 years old and what he's built it to. But, you know, this, like, entrepreneurial bro, this make a LLC or else you're a piece of shit, the red pill stuff and OnlyFans chicks, like, that kind of content has a shelf life. And I feel like that content is starting to decline a little bit. A hundred percent. Because is. with the entrepreneurial bro stuff and not saying that Gary Vee does this, but like you said, sometimes you'll consume a lot of it and then you're like, yo, I need to take a break for a couple of weeks from you. Yep. Like, the amount of times that I followed and unfollowed him is... Like 30 to 40. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it's it's a ton. And the reason why I'm saying all this is because a lot of that content, if you listen to one clip or you watch one video, you've watched them all. Yep. And that's where I feel like we had this conversation back at the win where the content that I'm creating and I always wanted to create, I want it to be a forever thing. Like sports give you 300,000 storylines a year. Yep. And I might be underselling that. There's always fresh. Mm -hmm. the, the preview show last year is going to look way different than the preview show this year. You get new information. You get new stats. You get new sports trends going on. All of a sudden now, I'm just saying this as an example, we're paying the running back, right? right. Where last year we weren't. Shit, do we need a $30 million wide receiver? The Chiefs just won one with no 1,000-yard receiver. I know Kelsey – had like 986 and he sat out, but right. it's always fresh content. And that's something, man, if I could give anybody advice, because, you know, th this time of year with the off season, I like having these kind of conversations too. And I feel like that's the thing that I look at. When I see a content creator, I can immediately tell if, yo, you're hot right now, like on fire, I don't know, 18 months from now. Yeah. I always say that you fall in love with the host. The reason why you've grown Veterans Minimum to be as big as it is because you've been yourself. And sure, there's a whole bunch of new storylines, but like you let yourself shine. And I think a lot of these uh, podcasters that like ride the wave just notice like, are they guest space? Are you here because they spit like knowledge or they're, they're funny as hell when they're bringing on these other big name people? It's it's very interesting, the podcast world um, and the content creation world. I see so many people that have no idea of who they are, yet they want to go on camera and they think, like, it's going to work. It's like you haven't figured yourself out. So, you know, if you ever are, like, struggling and you're a podcaster, you're like, I, I want this shit to, to pop off, like, you got to – buy into who you are and the way that you present yourself. And that is what separates people that are really good to people that are just doing it because like, oh, everyone's got a podcast now. And so I get to see it every fucking day here. You get to see it. I, you deal with people, though, that have a certain uh, echelon to them, like the podcast that you've worked with. And I'm sure there's been there's been ones that aren't as good, but you already have people that are Getting big name guests, like the pedigree and the game that they play is a lot higher level than just somebody that walks into our doors and it's like starting up a podcast from nothing. So it's it's very true what you're saying. Um, there's there's content that is like going to go away. The red pill stuff for sure. But I would even just say, bro, like if you're a guest based podcast, like Good luck. Like yeah. like four months from now when that fucking guest list runs out, like it's very, very difficult. No, nah, man, you said there's a lot of truth to what you're saying too, and I agree with you because when when I get asked to like I'll do Zoom calls with some schools. I've been to UNLV a bunch. Shout out to Professor Ben Morris. I know he's yep. been by here too. 
And just in general, man, I have a lot of people hit me up and like, yo, I want to get in the con. I'm like, yeah, go ahead. You know, I'm not someone that's going to shit on you if you want to get a podcast. Like, by all means. Mm -hmm. But just know it's going to take time, especially if you want it to be good. Can you catch on with the new trend and the it topics going on? Like, I call it the Andrew Tate stuff, the red pill, whatever it might be. But people see something that works and they jump on it, right? It's mm -hmm. the same thing in, like, the music industry, the new trend going on. Everyone starts to bite that. But I tell people all the time, and it sounds so cliche and lame because like, it sounds very generic, but you got to be yourself and you got to – people come to listen to the show for me, and I don't want to sound like an egomaniac, but at, no, at the core, the truth, bro. it's because people know <laughs> like who I am. And if you're a host, you have to – you can't just be Q&A. You can't just be guest dependent because, yo, I've listened to shows that have big platforms. And um, I tell the host after, I'm like, yo, bro, I don't know nothing about you. Yeah. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, it's, it's very dependent on the guest. And you have to, bro, they could go listen to how many yards per carry Saquon had with the Giants anywhere else. But you have to give them your flavor and your personality. And that's what makes people gravitate to you and you build a community. And then you go from there. And then you, uh, you know, you realize, like, I'm a fucking superstar now. You know, I fucking bought into myself. And that's uh, what podcasting can provide to you. Content creation can provide to you a little validation. I always feel like the best content creators were the kids that got, like, bullied in school. Mm. Like, low-key. Like, you know, they were able to, like, find their selves throughout, like, a, a life full of turmoil. And then they made it out on the other side. And, like, they fucking live life way higher than anybody else does because they've already been through the shit, you know? And now they're just like, no, you're going to get my side for the rest of time now. So, yeah. Fuck yeah. That's a little fun fact. I like that. I like that. All if right. you're bullied in school, start a podcast. That's that's what I'm getting to. Hey, I get a lot of shit for this when I say it, but bullying is dope. If, if you take that, if you take that and... And you, are upset about it, you're a problem. No, I think if you take that, like, it could be very beneficial, bro. Like, I was close to 250 pounds, and all my friends did back home was call me a fat fuck, fat bastard. And it got me motivated and be like, yo, first of all, they're right. Yes, yes. <laughs> right? Like, they're exposing yes. a lot of truth to what they're saying. And mm -hmm. I, I pride myself on being self-aware. And I know I put on, like, 15 pounds between Christmas and the Super Bowl. And then I, I locked in afterwards. Now, I can't be doing that all the time. That's that's the problem I used to have when I was younger. I would, you know, people were always saying, depending on when you caught me, I'd be like, yo, you're in the best shape ever to, holy shit, what happened to you? Yeah. Right? But yeah. The, I, th I think bullying could be dope. You know, I bully you sometimes into some conversations. And gotcha. we get into I some, love that shit. Some great combos, you know what I'm yeah. saying? <laughs> I don't get bullied enough here at the studio. I am the studio bully. Like, and I do it for everyone's better being. But I'm also just like, I will clown your ass. Like, I don't, That's, I have no filter. Stand by it forever. That's, if you want to know if I'll come and save you at three in the morning, it's because I troll you. If I troll you, just know that, yo, I'll call Nick, he'll come through. Yes. If I don't troll you... Don't fucking call me. I ain't coming. <laughs> Fuck that. You know what I'm saying? Fuck that. All right. I want to ask you a couple of things. Mm -hmm. um, so Calvin Ridley goes to the Tennessee Titans. And, you know, he's 29 years old. Um, was chasing the money, which you always should, right? Like, I think the athlete should always go to the back first, worry about everything after. You see it a lot in sports, at least in my opinion, where early on they they don't really ch chase history and legacy and and like championships. It's like when they get to their thirties, they're like, "Damn, bro, I don't know how many more years I have left. Let me let me try to grab a championship." Right? Yeah, like now I've, I've I've set up generational wealth from my friend, my family, and my friends, and I have all these other side projects that I'll be good post playing. Now let me let me get a ring so I could be in that. You know, in that, that tier. Calvin Ridley goes to the Tennessee Titans. And for those that don't know, you can actually bet on where players are going to go. Right? Like That's right dope. now at the moment, J.J. McCarthy, the favorite is Minnesota, minus 120 for him to go to the, the Vikings. Mm -hmm. Right? Calvin Ridley, the day before they announced where he was going, the Titans were plus 1,800. Mm-hmm. 
We know his track record. We know the history with Calvin Ridley. Hashtag one of us. Hashtag one of us, baby. Degenning all day. It's a little suspicious, bro, that he ends up going through the time. It came out of nowhere. Came out of nowhere. As a free agent, you do have the luxury to pick. It's the first time in your career where, yo, I have a say. Because when I get drafted, unless you pull an Eli Manning and yeah. a John Elway, you're going where they pick you. Correct. When you're a free agent, you're like, you know what? Let me test the waters a little bit. Let me get on Hinge and see what's available. Right. He goes to a team that's 18-1. to 1. I don't know, bro. I know accusations can be very serious. I'm being very playful. This is satire. However, Nick, pretty suspicious, bro. When you uh, when you had said that, and you'd sent that to me, and I'm like, uh, my first question is, did the line move after Calvin Ridley got added to the Titans? Well, he went to the Titans. Yeah, I'm, no. I'm saying you you were saying they're to win the Super Bowl. They were no, 18. no, no. For him to go there, hold up. I definitely read that wrong. I thought it was yeah, for them to win no, the title. No, you can you can bet on where players like right now you can bet. Because then you said JJ McCarthy, and I was like, of course you could probably bet on where the player's gonna get drafted, but I didn't think about free agency. Yeah, this, with free So who the hell takes this type of action? A lot of a lot of legitimate sports books will take this kind of action. Now they hmm. might limit you. They might say that for yeah, each I would user, like yeah, five hundred bucks on yeah, or a hundred bucks because right. that could be insider information. Definitely, you know, like if I'm in the league and I go to you, I'm like, yo, bro, I'm signing with the Cowboys. As a degenerating, you got to go and look at the odds of where is Nick Day is going to land on, and the fact that we punish, like, listen to this, Calvin Ridley. If he did capitalize on this, which he could have, right? You look at all the senators and Congress people in the United States of America and the way that they insider trade on stocks to make hundreds of millions of dollars. And this man with his slight, <laughs> dude, he could have even been limited. Think about how tough it would be, right? If you were trying to make a real, real bag and they were limiting it at a hundred bucks, mm. you're not texting or calling a hundred people to go put this in. You know, like you, you have to logically think about well, a way to, <laughs> I don't know. Like you know, how, how could you profit from this? Cause I'm trying to think if he did do this, how difficult would it be to make a hundred thousand dollars? I also think when you're him and you're going to make 50 million guaranteed. Yes. How much can you possibly benefit? Cause, cause you're, you can't go to a window. Imagine Calvin Ridley walking up to the win. And being like, yo, bro, can can I get a a million dollars on Calvin Ridley? To and he and he has the glasses and the mustache, <laughs> like the fake the fake setup and the fucking top hat. Yeah, They're like yo, can I get a million dollars on Calvin Ridley to go to the Titans? They're gonna be like, yo, bro, get the fuck out of here, dude. Pit boss, come here. Yeah, to, what's happening? You can't make those. That's why I'm I'm. I'm just super interested. I in want to tie. Out. Yeah, because I want to tie it into. Something that happens all the time. And look, I think my my honest opinion about athletes betting, I don't want you betting on your own team. Okay. I don't want you betting on your own league. However, there's been instances where athletes get in trouble for betting on different sports. Yeah. Right? Like just naming names to, to make the case. Say Devin Booker is in Vegas mm -hmm. for the Super Bowl. He wants to lay half a mil on – the Chiefs, he could get in trouble for that. Mm -hmm. Why? That I don't understand. Now, if he's betting unders on his point total, nah, I'm like, oh, that's that that I don't like. Yeah, but what's what's different from them going to the casinos and hitting the craps tables, roulettes, and baccarat and all that stuff? What's what's so different because you are an athlete? Yeah, I I'm completely on the athlete side to be able to gamble, and I do think that. If they and they will get to this point, Nick, I am making this a point right here on this show. Players will be able to bet on their teams and their overs in the next 15 years without a doubt. I think they're going to restructure contracts to have sports betting as part of an incentive. We mm. are at the early stage right now of DraftKings coming in and. It's DraftKings, Caesars, and there's one other one. FanDuel. That, and FanDuel that are with the NFL. So just wait and see, dude. It's I, going to become – wait, and then people are going to be able to 
bet inside the stadiums. That's coming within the next five to seven years. But players betting on themselves, but it will be monitored. Overs and for them to win outright. I think that will be instituted. So you're saying the only betting you'd allow an athlete to do would be to enhance his performance. 100%. Not decrease it. Correct. I kind of fuck with that a little bit. Because like if I'm an athlete... If I put 100,000 on me to drop 30, you know what I'm going to try to do? I'm going to try to drop 30 points. I'm going to try to get 30 <laughs> points. Yeah. If I'm plus 210 on the money line on the road mm-hmm. in Green Bay, I'm going to not fuck that game up. Correct. Now, if I'm betting the other side, that's where I'm like, no, nah, we can't have that. That is clearly point shaving. That is clearly yeah. an issue. But also, to your point, NBA League Pass – just implemented a live betting on their app when you're watching the games for FanDuel and DraftKings. Oh, my God. So you could do live betting on games as it's happening from NBA League Pass. So you're watching the Suns and the Mavericks play. Would you be able to put this in with your TV remote? Ooh, that I didn't dive too it's far mobile, into it. mobile for sure. Yeah, it's okay. definitely mobile. But you know, you're watching it there. Dog, the TV you're on, app would be not <laughs> the remote. Just, that'd be crazy. But like, you know, look, you're watching League Pass, right? You're watching the game Suns Mavericks, and it's halftime, and the Suns are down 20. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, you're down 20 in the NBA. It don't really matter. But, you know, 10 years ago, even Facts. before this three point boom, you were down 20. You're clearing your bench. Uh, you know, we got Washington tomorrow. Uh, Kawhi, you're not going back in there. Booker, you're done. Durant, you're done. Yep. Now it's, yeah, we go on a 12-0 run in a minute 40. We hit four threes in a row. Yeah. We're back in the game. So you're looking at it and you're saying, oh, damn, the Suns are plus 400. You know how I know? Because it's on the side of my TV. <laughs> I go on the app, bang, now I got a live bet. So they're, they're implementing that too. And the integrity of the sport, it's never going to be tampered with, in my opinion, at the professional level. Where it's going to be tampered with is, I don't know if you saw that video of the Vanderbilt quarterback that's been surfacing. Mm-mm. He got like approached by the mob and they offered him 300K. Yeah, this was like uh, early 2010s. Yeah, he's right? not, like, he's it not wasn't there recently. now. He's yeah, not there was, now. But I've always said, I if anyone's this. been listening to Veterans Minimum or any of my content, follow any of my stuff on any social media platform, I've always said from the beginning. The people you need to worry about throwing games are at the collegiate level. Because Mm -hmm. even with NIL, even with NIL, if I'm the left tackle for fucking Florida, I'm not making what the quarterback makes. I'll I'll probably be all right. But if someone comes to me and they're like, yo, 100K, can you either miss the game? Can you can Left tackle would be crazy because you can do a just – not block for a play, bro, and that's a fucking sack yeah. on a third and on a on third a, and a big, seven, big time third down slip sack, and it's, you could sell it like, oh shit, the guy just hit me with a crazy under, you know, a little <laughs> a little swim, a little Dwight Freeney spin move <laughs> on you, yeah. But it's always going to be at the collegiate level, yeah. Where every famous scandal that's gone down has been at the collegiate level because the money you can't go to Devin Booker and be like, yo, bro. I'm going to give you 50K to throw this game or to not cover by six and a half. He's going to be like, yo, suck my balls, bro. I make that in, a, in, in nine dribbles. Yeah, literally. It's never going to be tampered at the pro level. It's going to be tampered at collegiate. Correct. But I'm just saying, to, to piggyback on what you're describing here, players will be monitored at a crazy level at the professional level, and they will be able to place bets comfortably because – there's another side of me too, and this could be a sports book idea that FanDuel or DraftKings or Caesars is already thinking about, where it's you have your own book for professional athletes. Because think about the action that they would be able to to provide to their economy. I don't think they could bet with Gen Pop, is what I'm trying to say. Because the numbers, dude, they would be fucking throwing down sharp numbers. And these guys don't give a fuck because they're just, they got that in their bank account. But they'd be throwing down 10, 25 units on games. Well, we're just like, why would you want them betting in the same population as Mm. the normal people? 
And, bro, there's so many ways around it, too, dude. Like, I talk about the sports book stimulus checks when it went legal and live in New York where, yeah, I had, like, nine different cell phones at one weekend. I took I took my parents' cell phones. I took my grandma's, my aunt, uncle, my cousins. I was like, bro, just make these accounts. They're giving money out. Mm-hmm. And so, like, who who's to say that, you know, you're – you play you play in the NBA. Mm-hmm. I'm your brother. I'm like, yo, bro. You gotta get me nine points at least. <laughs> <laughs> you got like come on, bro. You wanna make Thanksgiving and Christmas awkward and our birthdays awkward? Like you can't get me nine? I need nine points, bro. That's nuts. And how are they gonna monitor that? Yeah. How how are they gonna make cause I could just be like, yo, I always bet my my brother's overs. Like I'm rooting for him. Yeah, I've always, I mean, I just think it's it's done at such a minute level, and they're they're smart. They're like the fucking IRS. They start tracking as soon as people yeah. start putting in excessive units on. Well, that's the thing. It's always random shit. It's, it's always the random shit and the most famous scandal. There's a Netflix special on it. I think it's called Untold or Bad Sport, but it's about the Arizona State basketball team in like the early '90s. Yep, yep. And mind you, this was at a time where they would show two college basketball games a night and it would always be duke michigan unc like syracuse back then big time schools. big time schools. they didn't have arizona state and you would have to follow the game on the ticker at the bottom of the casino dudes were coming in there playing 250 500k million dollar bets on the sun devils <laughs> it was the casinos and the sports books that were like hey man Y'all got to check out what's happening in Arizona State because yeah. every weekend we have a group of people coming in and putting like $2 million combined on Sun Devil games. And then they start tracking. They're like, hey, man, they're up 20 at halftime. But then they they only win by six. The line was nine. Huh. Oh. Oh. Make a couple phone calls. Yo, bro, you guys got to pull up to Arizona State. Some crazy shit going down. And then the scandal breaks out. So it's always the sports books that monitor because they want to make money, bro. Yeah. Would you ever want to be that role in a in a casino? Have you ever thought about being on the other side? Like you are the detective searching for these people. I think it'd be cool to add on the resume. Right? Yeah. It'd be pretty badass. Like you're just a bad – like veterans minimum is just like the bad boy show for like five years. We're out hunting all these athletes. Yeah. Private investigator shit. <laughs> yeah. Just sit at the sports book and be like, what you got today? Oh, yeah. I got I got Calvin Ridley Unders. Oh, where are you from? Georgia. Oh. Interesting. You went to Bama also? Huh. Wow. You went to Bama when you played with Ridley, huh? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Tell show, me what the show, fuck you bet. <laughs> show me the badge. <laughs> show me the badge, motherfucker. <laughs> Get down on the ground right now. <laughs> Yo, staying, no, staying with gambling and uh, betting issues, uh, shout out to Bruno Mars. One of us, baby. Oh, Apparently, God. Bruno Mars, if you guys haven't heard, allegedly has $50 million in gambling debt with the MGM Casino. For those that don't know, he had a residency. Does he still have one? No. 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 So he had a residency with the MGM, um, and the word is, He's racked up large debts at the tables um, by a very well-placed Vegas insider. He owes millions of dollars to the MGM from gambling. His debts have gone as high as $50 million. The MGM basically owns him. He makes $90 million a year off the deal that he made with the casino. Wow. But then he has to pay back his debt after taxes. Bruno Mars apparently makes $1.5 million per night. Jesus. Ninety million after taxes is closer to sixty million, and he owes about fifty. <laughs> yeah, the credit line that this man was extended is crazy. I did not know he was a one point five million dollar a night guy. Wow, right, dude. I also don't know how like, to measure that because I've I've heard of some like, like DJs get paid the most out here in Vegas, and that some that used to shock me, but now I'm like. Well, yeah, dude, the clubs make fucking fifty million dollars. It seems like every week. So, yo, can I can I tell you something? Yeah, maybe because I'm not into that music, like the house. Yeah, stuff. yeah. But bro, honestly, even with like, I'm a big hip hop fan. 
I've never in my life went out because someone was playing at the club. Correct. If I'm going, I'm going to a concert. I'm not going to fucking uh, Zook to see Tiesto. Like, yeah. I've, it's not happening. Every time, dude, the amount of times when I was first coming to Vegas, because I've done no pool parties since I moved out here, so I'm excited for this summer. Definitely want to get yep, 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 yep. Getting shredded gotta, for the summer. Got to get that arm right. I never went. Got to get that arm right, bro. We definitely got to get that arm right. But uh, I never, when I, we would buy tickets, we would just be like, yo, what are we doing Saturday? When we're there, let's go to what Republic. All right, bet we'd buy the tickets, and then it's like Calvin Harris is playing her fucking. That's about. And they get paid. Those DJs would get paid anywhere from half, half a mil to, above that. Yeah, for an appearance, but nuts, dude. And and I know like these are influencers, so it's different. But there's influencers that make like fifty bands just to show up to a club on a flyer. So I've never been able to measure what someone's value is to a club, right? The price is right depending on where you're going. Mm -hmm. I know some people that make $50,000 just to show up to the club, and, and they're like Courtney from high school just because she's popping on, on, on social TikTok, media right? or TikTok. Yeah. yeah. So how do you measure a Bruno Mars who's a platinum-winning artist and Emmy Awards and all, not Emmys, but Grammys and shit? Like, I can never measure that. What game is Bruno Mars playing is he setting millions of dollars on fire? Oh, dude, like, you can you can easily seeing how fast it burns. Bro, I take you the can, under. You can easily you go to high high limit high roller sections, where I've told this story before. There is a very prominent wide receiver in the NFL whose contract is coming up. I remember you told me this, and I told you the exact name, but I'm gonna leave yeah. it off because I'm not a snitch. However, he goes to the high roller section every single time I've seen him. It's high roller. That's minimum 100k to sit. Now, we don't know what he's buying back for. We don't know how much he sat with initially. Maybe he sits down with a million dollars. But, dude, if you're playing 100 k a hand of blackjack, you're playing 50 k a spin of roulette, you, you stay there for 30 minutes, you can see how quickly you can run up those numbers, bro. Facts. It's, it's, not, as, it's not as impossible to think when you really – when you are in that space and you're familiar with it, because yeah. I've had people be like, "How did he? How did he lose two million dollars in Atlantic City?" It's like, bro, how? I can give you nine reasons right now off the top, and I haven't even thought about it too much. Yeah, it's it's those kind of things where it adds up. Yeah, MGM's got his ass on lock. You, yeah, that's a hundred percent correct. Because now, whenever they're like, Bruno, you're going to play July Fourth weekend. There's no exceptions. And if you don't, we're suing you. Is that the way that would work? Would they would they sue Bruno Mars for not paying that back? Is there uh is there an affirm? Is there a, a pay boo for fucking Klarna? fifty Klarna? for fifty million dollars to give back to the MGM? What type of payment plan are you on? Or this is what I think the MGM does. Yes, Bruno Mars owes us fifty million dollars. Your credit line is still a hundred million, so we got fifty more to go, Bruno. You keep playing, and then eventually, over time, like the casino gets gets theirs back. There's no way. There's no way Bruno Mars, if he wanted to, in a session, could say, "I'm going to try to win back this fifty million dollars." You'd have to put like a million on a number and hope it hits, and then you'd have to do it again <laughs> to turn a profit. <laughs> That's like thirty-six to one odds in order for you to. to that is that. true. That would get them there. Man, it's crazy, dude. Like you hear some stories about athletes that end up retiring, and you know everyone has vices, though, bro. Yeah, like everyone has a thing that they spend money on. It could be material stuff, it could be cars, jewelry, it could be escorts, it mm -hmm. could be whatever like gambling drugs cars the yeah like the but some people some people with their vices uh it could be catastrophic man it could you hear about these stories where dudes make 150 million dollars in their playing career and then they're broke yeah there's a whole documentary on it yep. like how dude how but then as you get older i'm like oh bro it's easy to just blow by yeah, that kind of money, especially when you're. John always tells us the owner here at the studio multiple stories about like one player in particular, Coco Crisp, would in a weekend in Miami spend a hundred twenty five thousand dollars. Oh, bro, yeah, in a weekend, and it's like 
and you go over all the things that happened, and I'm like, yeah, sure, that was a kick-ass weekend. But I've done the same things in Miami, maybe not in a fucking VIP setting for a uh, 1,000, you know? And it's like the perception is just so different because you're, you're so generous when you have that much. And I think early on what happens, because I've seen it at the studio, seen it at the studio where a big name, and I mean big name athlete, he'll come through 40 deep. Yep. Everybody's your friend at that moment in time. Everyone's fucking got their hand in and the then, cookie jar, bro. And then I'll see them 18 months later or, or I'll see them two years later and there's three people with them. I'm like, yo, what happened to the whole crew? I had to cut dead weight. Dead weight also means money because they're always like, yeah, you know, hand out God and whatnot. God damn, bro. And, oh, and I'll, t- I'll tell you the athlete off air. I have a friend of mine who her client was one of the best wide receivers on the planet. And when he first got into the league, would show up with 30, 40 people posse. Every Vegas weekend was half a million dollars in total. Mm-hmm. And now he shows up with four. And one of them is his agent. Agent, manager, homie. Yeah. And then the other one is like a childhood friend. And then one other person is a random, like, most of the times now it's like a content creator. Like, a, you know, yeah, my a camera, camera guy, guy rolling yeah. with. And Dope spot to be in. You start picking up cameras, people. Like, I'm telling you, it's the easiest way into, like, big circles. All you got to do is fucking record shit. And, yo, you know what's even crazier? I met Jack Harlow's camera guy. His childhood friend had no camera experience. Boom. All he said to him was like, yo, bro, I love being around you. You're one of my best friends. Let me give you a job. Just grab a camera. And now he's Jack Carlo's <laughs> camera guy. He's making a lot of money because he told me how much he makes. And he's like, yeah, man, I get to chill with my, with my best friend since fucking elementary school. And I yeah. just click a record. <laughs> yeah. To your point, bro, if, if you want to get into the content space, grab a camera. Right. This is free game right now. Grab a camera. Start shooting shit for like three, four months. Get the hang of it. Get the auto focus. Get the auto zoom. The manual focus. Get I all so that stuff down. Figure it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the backdrop to be further away. Like figure that out. Start DMing athletes, fitness people, bro. The new gym I go to, I call it a tripod gym. There's fucking, <laughs> there's tripods everywhere, and you know exactly what gym I'm talking about because yep. you recommended me going there. <laughs> but it's a tripod gym. All it is is someone's doing biceps. And they have someone filming them. And, yo, you can make a lot of money. And guess what? As a side gig, sometimes two, three times a week. Yeah. And the the networking from that organically, too. <sighs> Crazy. Oh, bro, that's, that's free game, honestly. Grab a camera. Invest in the camera. It could be a business expense, too. I sound like one of these entrepreneur bros now. Make an LLC. Hey, no, seriously. Uh, wake up at 4 a.m., uh, Cold plunge, hold the camera. Uh, hold the camera under the cold plunge to really set the tone yeah. for the day. Yeah. Nah, but for real, though, like grab a camera and, you know, you, you might get into circles with big name people and you might end up being Bruno Mars's camera guy and then you can make a documentary about how much money he really lost. Yeah. And then, you know what I'm saying? No, it's just, it's, I don't think you people understand. It's that easy. Yeah, it really you is. You know, when you're being filmed, you're like, oh, this is kind of awesome. That's the same way that the rest of the fucking world feels. So, you know, be on the other side of it. I'm stopping here just for, for break purposes. Three, two, one. All right, George. Uh, those were fun conversations with the betting. Yes. Um, I want to have a serious conversation with the draft lumen. And I want to talk about the first round quarterbacks. Okay. The reason why I want to talk about it is because For years, my stance has always been I would much rather trade for a known commodity than take a stab in the first round of draft picks. Mm -hmm. Because the history of the league, if you go to any year, go to any year on Wikipedia, NFL.com, DraftHistory.com, wherever it might be, pick a year and look at the first round picks. With the exception of like 2011, where it was like Von Miller, J.J. like it was... Hall of Famer after Hall of Famer, Julio Jones. Uh, With the exception of that, you look at the history of the first round, a third of them are Pro Bowl, all pros. And by Pro Bowl, I don't mean a fan vote. I mean, like, you're actually one of the best. Like, you're an all-star. at your league or at your position. A third of them don't get a second contract with the team or they're out the league when their rookie deal expires. And then a third of them is like, 
All right, George is our center. Yeah. We're not he's not an all pro, but he's steady. solid. He can help us win games. Like you're steady. Yeah, steady. Yeah. And I feel like the quarterback position, bro, do you think it's gotten more successful to hit on quarterbacks or worse in the first round? Well, I was looking at the I think this is drafthistory.com and I'm just starting to see like over the last 6 years, I feel like there's been more shots taken as opposed to like what you would see in the early 2000s. Like you had to be a really really premier quarterback in the early 2000s to be drafted in the first round. And now, I mean, you got a, a year like last year where you see three quarterbacks go in the first round. The year after that, or the year before that, we only had one with Kenny Pickett. 2021, we had, what is that, five? Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, and Mac Jones. Mm -hmm. So I do like taking the shot at this because it is such a premier position. And I think what the I, you can consider this the Patrick Mahomes chief effect, where it's you get your superstar quarterback on a rookie contract early, you can build so much talent around him to elevate his game. That's where I feel a lot of these NFL teams' minds are in terms of what modern-day NFL success is, where it's we're going to get a really, really good quarterback, a.k.a. what uh, C.J. Stroud's doing currently for the Texans, and it's like, you guys are good now for the next three years, Continue to bring in the best tools around him. And now you don't have to deal with the financial responsibility of going the way that you were describing, where it's like, let me find a known commodity and talent and shell out, you know, 60, 70 million in a signing bonus over four years. Like that's that's a that's a lot of money and that's a big shift. So I do like the fact that more quarterbacks are being taken. But I do think the the shelf life. And the way that you train that quarterback, because I, I did mention the Patrick Mahomes effect, he was a backup. Mm. He got to learn. I think this year, the Carolina Panthers would have been in a so much of a better situation had you started Andy Dalton weeks one through six if he sucked, which might have happened. The Panthers weren't that good. Now we got Bryce Young coming in, but it wasn't, oh, Bryce Young sucks because he was bad from the beginning to the end. Yeah, like he got benched around week three, you week four. You save him the fucking embarrassment, embarrassment. Yes, bro. Yes, he's yo, a first-round yeah. draft pick, okay? Yeah. He's coming from Alabama, and now he thinks he's dog shit, which he's he's not bad, but, like, he certainly didn't have moments this year where everyone, like how Justin Fields would have a moment where, you know, he makes a 60-yard run where you're like, oh, well, you know, Justin Fields, he's still, he's still kind of good. I, tell me a Bryce Young highlight from this year. Pick sixes. <laughs> just, bro, getting clapped. There's a TikTok uh, that I watched where it was just like Panthers fans giving them shit before the game. And I'm like, that's that's what you don't want to have happen. I want to go back all the way to, let's go to 2010. Okay. I'm going to read you the first round quarterbacks. Well, this is going to be good. Sam Bradford. Tim Tebow, right? Uh, both guys left their team that drafted them. Um, Bradford changed the landscape of first-round quarterbacks. The the fifty million guaranteed before you stepping on the field. They're like, I don't know. That's, that's a lot of money for we kind of fucked up. Yeah, we kind of fucked up, right? So you changed the game there. The year after, Cam Newton, Jake Locker, Blaine Gabbert, Christian Ponder. Mm. Three of four bust. Yep. And the way I'm specifying bust in this scenario, you didn't re-up with your team. You ended up bouncing around, and then you're out the league, right? Correct. Cam Newton, hell of a draft pick. I think if anyone tells you otherwise, Cam Newton, what he did with Carolina, and if someone gives you a decade, bro. Yeah. Someone gives you a decade, I can't I can't be mad at you. A hundred percent. Right. You gave me 10 years, bro. That's crazy to think. Yeah. Give me 10 years. And and I didn't need to solid too. I I describe franchise quarterbacks like this. You give me 10 plus years, and at no point did I think of drafting a quarterback to replace you. I've only drafted quarterbacks 
let's have a competent backup in the event you get hurt because mm-hmm. we never know. That's how I des- describe franchise quarterbacks. Matt Ryan, Matthew Stafford, Cam Newton, mm-hmm. right? We go over to 2012. And this is the draft that kind of fucked it up for all quarterbacks that you wanted to sit and learn. This this is the draft of 2012 that fucked it up because you had five guys start immediately. Andrew Luck, Robert Griffin III, Ryan Tannehill, Brandon Whedon. And I know he's a third-round pick, but the other guy that started was Russell Wilson, right? But right. Luck, Griffin, Tannehill, Whedon. Mm. Luck was great, and then he retired. RG3 was off the team in four years. Yep. Brandon Whedon was a 28-year-old rookie, which I mean, or 25, I think. Yeah, he was, he was old as shit. Nah, he was old as shit, yeah. All right, so those are your first-round picks. 2013, we had EJ Manuel. I remember my uncle going crazy. He was a big FSU fan. Yeah. He used to call me, and he'd be like, G-E-J Manuel. He was fired up. He Bust, the, though. the world got duped because he threw the football over the sorority house. Yeah. Like I do those. remember that. <laughs> That's bad. It's like when Jamarcus Russell threw a football off one knee, and it was like 65 yards. That's it's like, hilarious. bro, in my prime, I was able to do 40 yards. Like, yeah. It's really not that. It's not as difficult. Kyle Bowler. Remember Kyle Bowler on the Ravens early 2000s? Which one? What did he do? Dude, would he did 60 yards off one knee. And everyone uh-huh. was like, holy shit, the arm strength. It's like, oh, oh. Congrats. Yeah. You, can't. you also can't do that in a game. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're not going to do that. Great. All right, let's get back to this, right? 2014. Blake Bortles, Johnny Manziel, Teddy Bridgewater. Yuck. Disgusting. Well, Blake had a s- slight run. Yeah, he did. He got uh, to. Uh, I would say Blake got a. Uh, I where what did he get injured? Because he went AFC Championship game to next year. Did they get Trevor Lawrence? No, they got Trevor Lawrence way down the line, way way down the line. Who was his replacement? I think he just sizzled out. Yeah, he got the whole next year. Yeah, he didn't get hurt. He just had a he had a killer run. Twenty fifteen, we have Jameis Winston and Marcus Mariota. Stud. Um, look, man. I know Winston is your boy, but also those guys are no longer on their team. And, and it's been that case for a while now. It's not like, yeah. you know, this was 2015. 2016, Jared Goff, Carson Wentz, Paxton Lynch. Wow. All three guys not on their team after four seasons? It's what happens when you draft a quarterback from, like, a fucking a random-ass school. Like, I think Bortles was... University UCF. University of Central Florida, Paxton Lynch, Memphis. Yeah. If your school is better at basketball than it is football, don't draft a quarterback from that Bro, school. I, w- I always say that. Don't don't take quarterbacks from basketball schools. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, Mitchell Trubisky, Pat Mahomes, Deshaun Watson. That was a good year. One of three panned out. Ah, uh, bro, just you got to separate Deshaun from the Rub and Tugs. Good run, especially early on in his rookie years. Bro, there's a video of me. If people go into the archives in, like, 2018, I said if I had a blank slate or maybe – no, it was the year after – the year before the Rub and Tugs, Watson has a monster season. I remember the video of J.J. Watt coming off the field, puts his arm around him. I wish we could do more for you or or something like that. We're wasting your years We're wasting your years. Yeah. And they had just gotten rid of D-Hop also. Mm-hmm. And he has this monster season, and then the rub and tugs and the massage parlor stuff breaks out. So, but I'm factoring that in because when he came, look, he missed a year and a half. And then when he came back, he's looked pretty ass to the point where people were having a serious conversation about, yeah, should we give the team to Joe Flacco? That's true. All right, so let's continue this list, and then we'll we'll break this Damn, all down. Deshaun, you could have fucking broke the cycle, bro. 2018, <laughs> right? Yeah, Baker, Sam Darnold, Josh Allen, Josh Rosen, Lamar Jackson. Two of three, two of five panned out initially. Baker's having a resurgence now. Correct. All right, 2019, you have Kyler Murray, Daniel Jones, Dwayne Haskins, rest in peace. Yes. Then you have 2020, you have Burrow, Tua, Herbert, Love, Man, I think all four hit, hit, which is, this is rare. This is the first time we went to 2020 where we would feel good about all four quarterbacks in the first round. But listen to this and just go over the colleges, Texas, LSU, Alabama, Oregon. Big time football programs. Yeah. 
Not these random fucking schools that just but yo, I, I don't irk know. me that I, you I think that, that told, talent level like, is that good. I like, I agree and disagree. I disagree in the sense of I'm a fan of it because I want you to win, though, at those schools. Correct. You know, like if you're if you're at Boston College and you go 10 and 2, I, I'm down with that. I feel it. Now, I don't want you going 3 and 8. That. Correct. Be, you know, you're not a winner. But if you're at a small school and you elevate them to the point because you're not playing with five star recruits on the outside. Yeah. You're playing with walk ons and two star recruits. How so you, there, if you're productive, I kinda I kinda fuck with it. Was Carson what you you went over Carson once, right? What yeah, year was he? Twenty seventeen. He was twenty seventeen. How do you feel about the people Sorry, twenty sixteen. Twenty sixteen. People coming from uh Division Two. Look, man, Carson was because I I see what you're saying. At least the schools that you're providing are just lower level Division One schools. Yeah. Look, man, Carson Wentz was minus four hundred week fifteen of the 2017 season to be the NFL MVP, and then he blew his knee out, and then from there he just never recovered. And I think also psychologically, you get hurt and the team still wins the Super Bowl. I don't give a fuck what anybody says, bro. You can't come back from that. That crushes you. And guess what? I th- I'm pretty sure there's a statue outside the arena of the Nick stadium Foles. of Nick Foles. Yeah. And you're the man. You're the man. You were about to win MVP. But you, every time you show up to work, there's a statue of another dude that did your job and they won. He did what you were supposed to do. It's uh it's kinda and look, I've I've been defending like getting cheated on. I, I've been yeah. I'm gonna come home and see that. Yeah. Your wife is cheating on you, and there's a statue of the dude that's banging her outside your crib that you got to pull up to every time. A little pissing fountain from his big dick. Yeah, <laughs> just fucking slanging down to the kneecap. That's what it was like for Carson Wentz, bro. Do you think Carson Wentz should honestly sue Trey Lance for some of his contract? Speaking of Trey Lance, 2021, Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, Mac Jones. How many have hit from that? One? And and there's some heat on Trevor Lawrence, too. Trey Lance is in that as well. And then let's just wrap this up quick. We Damn. had Kenny Pickett, and then last year we had Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, and Anthony, Anthony Rich. Richardson. So what my point is, is, dude, a lot of one for four panned out, a lot of two for five panned out, a lot of nobody panned out. It's it's very hard to find a quarterback. It seems like it's getting worse. And it seems like just off percentages, if you have four guys, based on the history of the league, with the exception of the the Tua, Herbert, Burrow, Love year, right. which we didn't know about Love until this season, if you have four quarterbacks, let's use this year's class, Drake May, Daniels, Caleb Williams, and McCarthy, one guy's going to be good. Like, very, very good. Two guys are going to suck. And one guy, we might have to wait a couple of years to see. That's the history of the league, bro. Yeah. That's the history of the league. And it's crazy. And, dude, the reason, the, the main reason why I'm bringing all this up, Justin Fields traded, Mac Jones traded, Zach Wilson to be traded, all within the last five days. And these are Kenny Pickett. Yeah. Like, bro. Kenny Pickett was two years ago, dude. They drafted him in 2022, and they were like, mm, he sucks. He sucks. It's crazy, dude. It's hard to find a quarterback. That's why when you do find a quarterback, like a yeah. Kirk Cousins, you got to give him $40 here's, million. Here's what I will say. If anything, it allows these people to be competent backups because they are being put into the situations where you do have game starts and experiences and that is extremely valuable to wherever you're going to be traded. And the majority of the times when you're drafted in the first round at quarterback, you're being drafted to a shitty team and franchise. So having to, you know, revitalize revitalize a, an entire franchise is that's why it's it's such a small pool that succeed. But I like the fact that we get to see rookie quarterbacks starting. Like I, I like this this uh, era and generation we're in because if it wasn't for the Andrew Lux, then we would really have to be waiting like, bro, till these players were what, 27, 28? Till we see like a, a first 
full year of your potential. Like Lamar Jackson's won two MVPs. He's 25 years old. That's crazy. Yeah. I think the ones that have succeeded have uberly succeeded. Well, also, think about Lamar. He went to a team like Baltimore, which mm -hmm. they they took him at the end of the draft. They traded back in to get him because they were already good, mm -hmm. right? The Chiefs traded up to get Mahomes. Yeah. They were, those guys elevated the team, too. Don't get it twisted. But you could have so went keep to your, worse. Okay, I think you're on to something. Keep your eyes open for really good teams that move up in the draft to get a quarterback. Yeah. That is actually a very I mean, interesting bro, I would, proposition. I would make the case that Caleb Williams, he goes to the Bears. He's in one of the better number one pick, holy shit, the franchise sucks situations out there because of, first of all, this is a team that didn't have the number one pick. It's Carolina. So you're going to a team that won what seven games last year, six mm -hmm. or seven games? Competent, competent, and you know they got DJ Moore, they got Keenan Allen now. Maybe they snag another wide receiver. They're improving. So that team is not a real number one pick. It's like when the Dallas Cowboys drafted Zeke. The year they drafted Zeke, the reason why they did that is because Romo got hurt, and it was a shit show the whole year. That was a team that went to the NFC title game like 18 months before that. Romo goes down, they draft Zeke, and then Dak comes in, you know, Dak, Romo gets hurt again. And, you know, like, so the Cowboys and Dak walking into it, like, bro, I had the best line in the league. I, it was different from what. Right. And, and that's what I think Caleb Williams walks into. He walks into a very good situation. But you're right, dude. So much of it in any sport is where do you land? Mm-hmm. Where do you land? It's very, very important. So let us know what you guys think about the quarterbacks. You think there's any truth to that? What quarterbacks do you think are going to be bad? What quarterbacks do you think are going to be good uh, in this draft? Um, I want to end the show with this, dude. Um, Aaron Donald retired. <sighs> I know. At least ending, in my opinion, like on top as you can end. Yeah. I mean, going into your last year, and seeing the way that these teams would still throw double, triple teams at them, like it's a it's a, a situation similar to the NBA MVP, where it's like, are we really going to give Defensive Player of the Year to Aaron Donald every year? Like, well, I guess we can't do that. But he is the most difficult player to guard on the field every single week. So, man, that's a a legend. Where does he rank in greatest uh, defensive players of all time? I mean, he's definitely definitely up there. I think he makes the starting lineup if you were to build a, oh, yeah. the best defense ever. Yep. Ten-time Pro Bowler, eight-time All-Pro, one-time Super Bowl champion. Um, he's won countless Defensive Players of the Year awards. Um, uh, defensive Rookie of the Year, Defensive Player of the Year. He came in second, fourth, won it, won it, fifth, won it, third. And then uh, comeback player of the year, he came in ninth. So, like, in his prime, and he had a 20-and-a-half sack season um, as a defensive tackle. I think he also kind of changed the game, too, where, like, usually defensive tackles is like, ah, oh, you'll, you'll probably get four sacks, five sacks. You're a run stuffer. It's like, no, no, no. You're, you're getting Von Miller, Khalil Mack, Nick Bosa on the, on, on the center. Yeah, yeah. As a, as a three technique. And then we could also split you out wide if we need to. Have you rushed the passer there too? I think he was one of the few guys that actually accounted for the point spread as a mm. defensive player. Agreed. Like in his peak, if Aaron Donald was not playing. And also, dude, super durable. Like you're talking about a man who did not miss too many games. He he missed four games. His uh sorry, he actually played in 16, 16, 16, 14, 16, 16, 16, 16, 17, 11, 16. Like Gamer. Yeah. Oh, he started Damn. 150 of the 154 games that he played in. And most of those were early on that he didn't start them. And then after that, every game he played, he started, right? So, yeah, man, he's he's unbelievable. He got his Super Bowl. And uh, who's your favorite defensive player of all time that you've watched? You know, when you had asked me this earlier, I had uh, – I have one player that's really going to, like, throw you through a loop, but he was – at that moment in time when I was watching football, 
just such a lockdown corner, and it's Namdi Asama. Okay. So for the for the Raiders, my whenever I would go to a game as a kid, and my uncle would just be like, "Watch the way." I remember one time it was him versus Steve Smith. He's like, "Just watch the way that he is glued to him." And as soon as my uncle said that, they ran a go ball to Steve Smith. Namdi hops up, one handed interception. Cradles it down, and that's what I, at that moment in time I was like, I think this might be one of the best fucking corners I've ever seen in my entire life. Yeah, because then I start watching every Raider game week in and week out, and he was, uh, he's a he's a corner that doesn't get talked about too often, but Awesome is well, he doesn't get talked about often because when he went to Philly, he was not the same player. Correct, and I think that kind of soured a bunch of people. I do think at a Corner position, you got to get out of there once you start losing your step, bro. And I do remember him having an injury early on in Philly, I'm pretty sure. They slowed him down that little extra gear. But as far as fun players to watch, yeah. I, 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 I'm I pretty sure I threw you for a loop there. You did. Yeah, I didn't expect that. But I'm also not surprised by it, too, because he was, he was that dude Yeah, for a while. Um, I'm going to give you two. Okay. I think my favorite season of a defensive player ever was Revis in 09. Yeah. Like, bro. You All look the graphics at, made. The graphics, it's like Chad Johnson, Randy Moss, Steve Smith, Andre Johnson, like Brandon Marshall. Like the, the names that would get two for 30, yeah. <laughs> one for seven was ridiculous. And he, because I didn't get to grow up with Deion Sanders. And I would always hear about, yo, he was shut down the whole right side of the field, or the whole left side, right? Like, Revis, you basically would take away your number one weapon. And he also traveled. He went in the slot. He went to the left. He went to the right. X, Y position. It didn't matter. Like, he was going wherever. Like, nah, bro. Randy, right. you're going for some Gatorade? I'm, I'm going to step off the field. Oh, you're back after one play? Yeah, I guess he's back. Daddy's yeah. back. <laughs> I'm out here. Like, that's it. So Revis and 09, but collectively, the whole body of work, Ed Reed, bro. Ed Reed. Savage. Ed Reed was, that was, uh, and when I got into football, he was still like in his absolute like apex. I got yeah. into football really, really around like 04, 05. Mm -hmm. And dude, I just remember, I never was more fascinated by a defensive player than him. Like I would just watch him and it was just crazy, dude. The plays he would make and just the mind games and how smart he was. Mm -hmm. And then, Fast forward to years later, NFL Network does this like great documentary with Bill Belichick, Chris Collinsworth, and Ed Reed is there, and Belichick puts him over to use the wrestling term. How like you made a play against Peyton where you knew when Peyton pumps that way, he also throws that way, but the tendency would be like you pump this way, you throw that way, right? Like yeah. kind of, and Ed Reed baited him. You know when he saw the pump, he went the wrong way. But on purpose because he knew Peyton he, was still going to throw it. And he looped back around and he picked it on like Reggie Wayne, another guy who he shut down right. in that graphic, right? Uh, Revis, that is. But Ed Reed, man, was just. And until like the end, he was still. When he was still with the Ravens and they won the Super Bowl, he was still like, Ed Reed. Yeah. That's I, my favorite defensive player, bro. As far as. Because uh, I, I, the last one I'll leave with, as far as linebacker goes. Brian Erlacher. Erlacher was a beast, yeah. I loved, Woof. I loved, bro, I loved Luke Keekley. Yeah, oh, see, that's who, I, I had a lot of uh, players when I played in high school, they were like, they were like, Carmona knows everything. He's just like Luke Keekley. Luke like, Keekley was And that, that was at the dude, time, bro, bro, like the entire team got the Cam Newton cleats. It was pretty dope, like, you know, seeing everybody in the fucking boots, you know, because it would go all the way up to, and I was just like, yeah, dude, I'm wearing the Cam Newtons, I play like Luke Keekley. Fuck yeah, bro. Badass. You were panted up. I was. I was calling it out. I was like, yo, he's pulling there. He's pulling there. They're going to run the sweep. They're going to run the sweep. They run the sweep. I stop it for a loss of four. Everyone would be like, how does he know this? Genius. Defensive genius. Let's go. Let's <laughs> go. Let us know who some of your favorite defensive players are of all time. And uh, yeah, man. George, thanks for coming on. Nick, thank gentle, you. Gentle, gentle. Thank you. Pre uh, yeah. Gentle We got to get you right for beach time in the summer tiesto yeah, bro yeah for tiesto i'm so thrilled um, 
All right, everybody. At Nick Day is 10 is you can find me. All things Veterans Minimum are at Veterans Minimum. George, let the people know where they can find you. At Mr. George Carmona. Mr. George will get you there. I'm, I'm popular enough to Mr. George on Instagram. It's this guy. And for those watching, we are going to announce the winner of the Super Bowl helmet. I haven't forgot. We're going to do the drawing right now with George uh, behind the scenes, and then I'll post it after. So be sure to check that out, and we'll catch you guys next time.